Hi. <clears throat> you know, I've often wondered, and I've heard all kind of theories about the great falling away that everybody has predicted in the end times. <clears throat> um, I uh, hear all kind of stuff about, you know, everybody's talking about aliens coming down and convincing you that Jesus wasn't real. Uh, the fallen angels, which is ridiculous. Um, you know, like the church, everybody's going to fall away when they see some kind of new savior come on the, on the scene. And, and it just never made sense to me. I never could believe anything that I heard. And until I learned there was another doctrine that overtook the Baptist church. The Baptist church became Roman Catholic, basically. But Paul said there will be another gospel, another Jesus. And it's taken over. And Constantine, I think it was 325, he brought the pagans into the church. And Paul said it started then. when he was alive. It started when Paul was alive, the falling away. But the tares came into the church. The pagans came into the church. The pagans are running the church now. The pagans are the majority of people that are in the church. This is a book I've had for a while and I've read it more than once. It's called The Southern Baptist, The Doctrine of Election. And it Chronicles the preachers that used to preach in this country and in England. And it talks about their belief in the sovereignty of God in election. We were not taught. The Baptist church has lied to me and you and the full gospels and the Pentecostals and every other religion that, I mean, the Pentecostals, uh, I, I, I went to a Pentecostal church for a little while there and um, they would sit around and jump up and down and wait for the Holy Spirit to come. You know, like it's going to fall. People don't even know what the Holy Spirit is. They did not teach us what the Holy Spirit is. I got it right here. Let me get my old guy glasses on. What the Holy Spirit is. This is John 14, 16, and 17. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. And verse 17, even is not in there. It says, I will uh, uh, send you a comforter that will abide with, you, abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, whom the majority of pagans that are in the church cannot receive. Because it seeth, they seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he, he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. The spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit is the truth. John 15 and 26. The Bible tells us everything we need to know. John 15 and 26. But when the Comforter is come, when I will send unto you from the Father, the spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. John 16 and 13. How be it when he, just talking about the Holy Spirit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whosoever he shall hear, whatsoever he shall hear, shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. 1 John 5 and 6. And it is the spirit that beareth witness, because the spirit is truth. The Holy Spirit is the truth. It's not waiting to fall from the sky. The Holy Spirit is in our guide that we have, the Bible. I'm going to, I'm just, before I go into what I, I've been studying, I'm going to read a, a couple of inserts from this. From, these are preachers, Baptist preachers. This one, George Whitfield, everybody knows him, 1714 to 1717. 
1770. All others leave free will in man and make him in part at least a savior unto himself. He's talking about God chooses men to save them, not men choosing God. My soul, come not thou near the secret of those who teach such things. I know Christ is all in all. Man is nothing. He hath a free will to go to hell, but hath none to go to heaven, till God worketh in him to will and to do of his good pleasure. O oh, the excellence of the doctrine of election and predestination, and the saints final perseverance. I am persuaded till a man come to believe and feel this important truth, he cannot come out of himself, but when convinced of this and assured of the application of his heart, he then walketh by faith indeed. Love, not fear, constrains him to obedience. I bless God. His Spirit has convinced me of our eternal election by the Father through His Son. Of our free justification through faith in His blood, of our sanctification as a consequence of that, and of our final perseverance and glorification as a result of that. This I am persuaded. God hath joined together these neither men nor devils shall ever be able to put asunder. Was there any fitness for seen in us except a fitness for damnation? I believe not. No, God chose us from, the, from eternity. He called us in time, and I am persuaded will keep us from falling finally till time shall be no more. Let me read you another one. We know when a weeds grow in your front yard or weeds grow in the, in, the, in the fields, the weeds will take over. The weeds are the pagans that have taken over in this church and the false doctrine and the false teachers, the pagan teachers that have taken over and have taught Armenianism. Look it up. It was a battle. Is it God who saves us or is man able to save himself? Is man's free will, his ability to choose God? Well, let's see what else these preachers say. All right, let me go on to another one. Um, okay, this is Isaac Bacchus, 1724 to 1806, a Baptist preacher in America. Uh, let's see. Let's see, let's see, let's see. In short... The main objective I have ever heard against sovereignty election and certain salvation by free grace alone appears to me to spring from the root. Man who has flattered with the notion of being as God's uh, still conceit that he had a power in himself to do as he pleases. Let that pleasure be to comply or to Disappoint God's design. You know, the man has a choice to obey or disobey and to interrupt God's design in this whole operation that we are involved in. And therefore, if they are not disposed at present, in other words, if you're not ready, okay, if you're not disposed of at present to engage in his service, that he must wait their leisure. God has to wait on you. The God of the universe has to wait on you to make a decision. Okay, I'll read that again. At present, to engage in his service, that he must wait their leisure and be ready. God's waiting on you. Whenever they set about to work in good earnest, to grant them the assistance of his grace, and if they improve it well unto the end, then to receive them to his glory. Oh, what else? Oh, these are so good. Mm -mm -mm. Faith and obedience. Let's see, who's next? Who else could you read? Oh. Let's see. Oh, this is Francis Wayland. Okay. 
He was a, a Baptist pastor, president of Brown University, 1796 to 1865. My mind at one time rebelled against the doctrines of election. It seemed to me like partiality. I now perceive that I had no claim whatsoever on God, but that if I were lost, it was altogether my own fault. And if that if I were saved, it must be purely a deed of unmerited grace. Grace just means unmerited favor. I saw that this very doctrine was my only hope of salvation. For if God had not, had not sought me, I should never have sought him. There's so much more. I'll read something else next time. But <clears throat> look up Arminianism and how we've been lied to in this life. How the Baptist preachers, have, the, the false preachers, have taken over the Baptist church. Anyway, there was something in here. Oh, no, let me go back. That's another time. I really don't know what I'm going to name this, but it's, it's talking about love, okay, eventually. So just bear with me. We have to look at Matthew 24, 11 through 12. This is talking about today, okay? It says, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive you. Deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Now we're going to break down the words here to understand from the Greek. Now, he talked about shall deceive many. Deceive is the word plena. It means to stray from orthodoxy. It says to, it means to be out of the way. And Jesus said, I am the way. It means to roam or to wander. So to stray from orthodoxy just means to stray from sound doctrine. Now, what does the, the Old Testament say about straying, okay? Let's look at what Amos uh, describes, what it means to roam, to wander, to stray, when false prophets rule over you in your churches, and they are today. Amos 8, 11 through 13. Behold, the day comes, and it's here now, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but hearing the word of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north even to the east. They shall run to and fro and seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. In that day shall the fair virgin and the young men faint for thirst. Let's look at one of those words, faint, in the Hebrew. Alaf is the word. It means to be languid, okay? They become spiritually weak, spiritually lazy, for lack of the living water, the truth, the Holy Spirit. The false prophets that rule over you in the pulpits of America have deceived you, plainos. They cause you to go to and fro, to wander to and fro, from denomination to denomination, looking for something that they cannot give you. The American churches are drunk on false doctrine. That's mixing truth with a lie. That's the same thing. Oh, I, I, let, me, let me not stray for this. Matthew 24, 11 through 12, again, let's look at it. And many false prophets shall, shall, uh, many false prophets shall raise and shall deceive you. Prophets shall rise and shall deceive you. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And because iniquity shall abound, let's look at those two words, iniquity and abound. Iniquity, anomia. It means without law, wicked, no law of God, no obedience to the gospel. It means to be out of the way. That way is the narrow way. So that was iniquity. Now let's look at the word abound. It's platano in the Greek. It means to be, it means a form, it is a form of plathos, which means a fullness, a multitude. It means the majority. It's come to the full. So walking 
And then if you look at the last verse of that, the love of many shall wax cold. Walking in the commandments of God is going to die. It's going to cease in the church. So, if you know what the love of many shall wax cold, if you know what love is, then you know what he's talking about. Love is agape. It doesn't mean you have an emotional uh, attachment to your enemy or to somebody that you don't even know. 2 John 6 defines agape, not phileo. Agape, and this is love, agape, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that you've heard from the beginning. You should walk in it. So let's read Matthew 24, 11 through 12, with a bit more clarity. We're going we're gonna to explain it a little better. And many false prophets shall rise. Many false teachers will rule over you in the American pulpits. That's the great falling away. And shall deceive many, many of you who are pagans. The false teachers shall cause you to stray from orthodoxy and sound doctrine. They will cause you to roam, to wander from sea to sea, denomination to denomination, looking for living water that they don't have. There is no power in their words. They deny the power thereof, that God saves men, that men are not gods and cannot save themselves. Men cannot call down salvation. Salvation is a gift to those that God chooses. And because iniquity, no law of God, no obedience to the gospel, no instruction on the narrow way, they have come to the full. The teaching has come to the full. The pagan teachings have come to the full. It means the majority of the churches in this country. Because of that, the love of many shall wax cold. Walking in the commandments of God is going to die. It's going to cease. And it has in the American churches. The great falling away is complete. So I want to stop and, and look at 2 John 6 just for a second. It's talking about love. And this is love, agape, that we walk after his commandments, that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. Let's look at walk. Break it down. Walk in agape, love, the commandments of God. So walk is the word peripateo in the Greek. It means to follow as a companion or a votary. Walking in the commandments of God, you need to follow as a companion or a votary, V-O-T-A-R-Y. A votary means a follower, a defender, a disciple, a believer, a fanatic. Now let's break down walk into how it was created and what it, what it means. Walk, peripateo, comes from peri. It's to pierce. It means to pierce through, to go farther. And from pateo, which means a path. To walk in love, agape, to walk in the commandments is to obey the gospel, to walk in the narrow way, and Jesus said, I'm the way. To walk in agape means to pierce through and go farther on the narrow path, the narrow way. To obey when the world won't, when most won't. To walk in agape, to obey the gospel is to hold our Lord's words as close companion. To walk is to be a believer, a defender, a fanatic, a disciple in the Lord, of the Lord and his commandments. To walk in agape, love, is a way that few will travel. Jesus said few will find the narrow way. And none of us will, fear, will pierce through and go farther if God does not help us with trials and tribulations to mold us into what we are today, to be able to hear and see 
those who have ears to hear and eyes to see. Only those will understand what I'm saying. And that's few, because Jesus said few will find the narrow way. Narrow comes, is the word uh, thalibo, it comes from thalipsis, it means tribulation. Few will find the tribulation way. And when you say these truths to the, to the Christian community in this country, when you say these, you will be persecuted. These are the words from the scriptures. This is the gospel that was taught before Armenianism took over. Now let's, I'm going to go back to agape. Now what did Jesus say about agape? Walking in the commandments of God. If you understand the words and you have ears to hear this, you'll understand what I'm saying. Jesus, John 14 and 15. If you love agape me, keep my commandments. He said it right there. To agape me is to keep my commandments. And John 15 and 10. If ye keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abided in his love. Now let's, let's break down some words here because you, you break it down, you understand it more. Keep is the word tereo. It means to guard from loss. That's tereo is in the Greek means to guard from loss to fulfill a commandment. So, let's, let's insert that in there. If you love agape me, keep my commandments. If you love agape me, you will guard over my words so they're not changed and protect them from loss. If you love me, you will fulfill my commandments and walk in the narrow way and obey the gospel. Now let's look at one more word in there, and abide in his love. Abide is the word meno. It means to continue, to endure, to stand. That's what it means in the Greek. Abide meno is action, okay? It means to continue in the narrow way. Abide means you will endure the trials of God has chosen for you with the help of a merciful God. To abide is to stand for the truth of the gospel when others won't and you will stand alone there's not too many people that talks about this on the internet so let's look at John 15 and 10 with more clarification John 15 and 10 if you keep my commandments and guard over them and fulfill them then you shall abide which means continue and do a trials Stand when others won't, in my love, agape, in my words. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and guarded over them and fulfilled them and abide in his love. Jesus continued in and abided in his Father's commandments. Jesus endured ridicule as he walked in the narrow way. Jesus stood against false doctrine. He stood alone and was persecuted for that gospel. That's a lot. So let's recap love agape to walk in agape. I'm gonna recap it. I'm gonna repeat myself. That's the way I learn things. Love is to walk in the commandments of our Lord. Love is to follow and obey his words as a close companion. Walking in love agape is to pierce through, to go Father in the narrow way with the help of God. When we abide in his love, his commandments, we will endure ridicule and hatred from the world. And that's from the church people. When we abide in his love, his commandments, we will stand alone most of the time. In the end, walking in his commandments leads to inheriting eternal life. And Jesus said, if they hated me, They'll hate you also. Being hated by the world is a narrow way. And don't get me wrong, the world and this church that the United States has is one and the same. It's a worldly church. It has nothing to do with the scriptures. It's all about making people feel good and what's God gonna do for you? And money, the whores, 
Now, without God's help, none of us can walk in love, agape, his commandments, without the help of a merciful God. The Lord, basically, I under, what I understand, the Lord chastises each of us, chastises me and calls me to repent of my wicked ways. And he only does that when you understand the depth of the wickedness in your own heart. The Lord shines his light into my understanding, my heart. The heart was a place of understanding to the Jews. So when you hear him talking about the heart, it's the place of understanding. The Holy Spirit is the truth, the truth, and you understand it. That's what the Holy Spirit is. He let me see my own wickedness when he shined that light in. And God gives me a desire to study. And when I see, I do, I, I, when I study, I see just how far I am away from walking in the love and agape. What did Jesus say about his gospel? In Luke 9 and 23, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for me, for my sake, the same shall save it. To live the gospel is our cross. Jesus spells it out for us plainly. Now I haven't accomplished this, I'm far from it. But I just break down what he says and what the gospel, what does he say in, in Revelation? He comes back to take vengeance on all those who obey not the gospel. We're going to go over something that's part of the gospel, our cross. Matthew 5 and 44. Love your enemy. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you persecute you. But if you understand what love is, it's not all this emotional. You know, I listed out some things, you know, um, love agape your enemies. And it's plural there, enemies, plural. And most of his, the worst enemies he had was in the church, the so-called church at that time. And that's our enemies today. It's the false doctrine in this country. There will be many. In fact, most people in the church will be your adversary. Does it mean you're going to get all excited every time you see somebody you don't like and just want to go up and hug them? No. Does it mean I'll get all warm and fuzzy on the inside when I see them? No. No. Can it mean I have good feelings toward them no matter what they say or do toward me? No, that's not true. Excuse me. Can it mean I, I'll console them when they curse me and band, or vandalize my car? I love you anyway. No. Hmm. Am I to be nice when they hurt me or my family? Well, if you know what the word nice means and where it comes from, I'm definitely not nice. Nice is the word nasir. It means no science. Basically, it means sticking your head in the ground and everything around you is okay. And you're not supposed to say anything if you're politically correct. But nice. How many times did you hear people tell their kids, act nice? In other words, be something you're not. Nice. I am not nice. Kind is the word you can be. Kind means to meet a need. But I am far from nice because I will tell you what I think. And in this day and age, you know, they, they kick you off the internet for that. So, we have a phileo, which is an emotional feeling that we feel in our chest. And when we see the, our loved ones and we see them do something good, we have that. You have an emotional feeling for your wife and your children. But that is not agape. That is not loving your enemy. Okay? Love agape your enemy. Remember what 2 John 6 said, this is love, that we walk after his commandments. We walk in the commandments of God and apply them 
to your friends and your enemies evenly. That's walking in the commandments of God. We're not to show partiality to our to our friends just because they're our friends and slandering maybe somebody that you really don't like. We're not to do that because we know the sun shines on the good and the bad. The rain falls on the good and the bad. God feeds the good and the bad. So we are to apply the for us to love agape, our enemy, is to apply the laws of God evenly and fairly on everybody that we know, good and bad. That is loving your enemy. Let me keep on going here. I, I just wrote this out. When you do this, you are the children of your Father which is in heaven, and you are one of the sons of God. Now, I'm, I haven't learned to do this yet. But I, I, I'm, I'm waiting on God to change, change me as, as I grow older. And he has. So look, uh, look at part of the Ten Commandments. I mean, it's, it's easy. This is just easy stuff. The Seventh Commandment, Thou shalt not commit adultery with your neighbor or your enemy's wife. You apply it evenly. Thou shalt not steal from your neighbor or your enemy, even if in a bad deal that you got involved with, they steal from you. You're not to take vengeance like that. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor or your enemy. You're not to lie about your enemy, to hurt them in any way, just like you wouldn't do that to your friend. That is agape. Thou shalt not covet to want more that your neighbor has or your enemy. Not their house, their wife, their job, their position in the world. You know, we're not to want more than what God has given us in this life. So these are just simple things that you can apply and know that's loving agape, your enemy. You don't take vengeance on them. You don't take anything out on them. You, you treat them like you would want to be treated. That's the gospel. So, part of our cross, he said, pick your cross up daily. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Deny. Deny the ways of the world that we've been taught. Utterly deny. And take up his cross and follow me. Our cross is to follow and obey his teaching. It's the narrow way. Narrow is the word to leave up comes ellipsis it means a tribulation way and if we obey and speak his words and live the best that we can tribulations will follow not only from the, the heathens but primarily from those that you know in the church right now when you tell them that it's God that saves you and you cannot save themselves that Christ mass is paganism it was brought into the church it's Christ Mass. It's Roman Catholicism. They shortened the words and made it Christmas. The first Christmas tree was shown to us in the Bible. Let me go back to this. Sorry. For whosoever shall save his life and not walk after, I'm inserting this, and not walk in the commandments of God and take, they take the easy path with no tribulation and no hate from the world, whosoever would do that will not save his life. He shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, it means deny yourself. We need to deny the ways we've been taught. The same shall save it. For what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world, money, riches, fame, power, and lose himself and be cast away? Our cross to bear daily is the gospel. It's our cross. It's a narrow way. It's agape. It's walking in the commandments of God. It's obeying. It's daily. It's loving your enemy. Sorry, I hit this and it shakes up there. It is applying the laws of God evenly 
between those you like and those that you dislike, friend or enemy. And we're not to be respecter of persons. I can quote scriptures. I found that easy. I found it easy to tell people that God chooses people that they don't choose God. To tell people that Christ mass is paganism. Yeah. You can tell them. I find it easy to tell people that there's no such thing as get saved or sinner's prayer. That's It's not in the scriptures. But that's part of a daily cross. But to me, the hardest part is this. It's loving your enemy, applying the laws of God evenly to friends and foes. You know, he said, it rains on the good and the bad. His laws are to be applied on the good and the bad. Part of that cross that says, love agape, my enemy, is the hardest one for me, and I'm learning, I'm learning to do it. Like that video I made yesterday. I have to re reassess the things that I've done daily. And I shouldn't have honked my horn like that. I shouldn't have been, I, I shouldn't have rolled down my window. I shouldn't have put myself in that situation. Because I did not demonstrate loving my enemy. It should have never happened. That was all on me. Stop and think about grace, unmerited favor, faith that you were given. If he, you were given faith, he's, give, he's, he's turned you. He's caused you to repent. To repent just means to be turned and think differently. And if you have the Holy Spirit, the truth, it's the truth in you that is changing you. We don't deserve grace salvation, faith, but God gave it to us as a gift despite who we are. And throughout all this, he protects me from me. I am my worst enemy. You are your worst enemy, whether you know it or not. The hardest part for me is learning to obey and love, to apply the commandments of God to friends and enemy. Our enemies don't deserve to be treated the way our enemies don't deserve to be treated the way we are commanded to treat them. They don't deserve it. They don't deserve rain. They don't deserve sunshine. Just like we don't deserve the gift of faith. Think about it. We are to give it. We're commanded to do those things because the commandments of God apply to friend and foe and how we treat them. To be truly a child of the Father in heaven, we have to do just that. Treat them like we want to be treated, fairly and equitable. I wrote something on the back of here. Oh yeah, he that doeth truth come to the light. We are to preach the true gospel of Jesus Christ, which will cause tribulation from the pagan American church. And we are to treat the non-believers, the atheist, the lost, the lonely, with love, agape. That means walking the commandments of God toward them and our actions just like we want to be treated, even if they don't treat you that way. I list uh, 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 just some commandments here, just to think about. We're not to be respecters of persons and honor people with money and power and tell the poor man to be seated in the back of the room. We are not to judge our enemies guilty in a matter just because they are your enemy. We're to be judging fairly. We are not to cheat our enemy in a business deal, even if they've cheated you in one. We are not to retaliate in any unjust manner toward our enemy. Stay within the bounds of the law. 
And Jesus said, if they strike you on the one cheek, turn to them the other. That's hard. Huh. This is not the American way, but it's the Lord's way. It's part of the gospel. And I pray for strength to do the right thing if I face that. That's going to be really hard. If the rain falls on the good and the bad, and the sun shines on the good and the bad, we are to walk in the commandments of God toward the good and the bad. Let's look at Matthew 5 and 44 again. But I say unto you, love agape your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. All right. He said, bless them that curse you. What does that mean? Does it mean, you know, when somebody's screaming and hollering at you, you say, God bless them? No. Somebody's screaming and hollering at you, just leave. You can't deal with that situation. You have to get away. Bless them. Bless is the word eulageo. In the, nobody explains this to us in the Baptist church. Nobody has ever taught me this stuff in the Baptist church. They are pagan. They will not go to definitions and explain this to us. Bless them that curse you. What does that mean? Do you know? Bless. Eulago. Eulageo is the word in the Greek. It comes from eu, which means well or good, and logos, which means word, the divine expression. It means preach the gospel, the good news, the teachings of our Lord. Bless them. Preach the gospel. Proverbs 11, 11 gives us an example and defines this. If you think about it, by the blessings of the upright, the city is exalted, is at peace, is joyful and happy, but is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. By the blessings of the upright, the city is blessed by men who walk in the commandments of God. The city is blessed, it's joyful and at peace when men walk in the narrow way. Jesus is our example of how to bless them that curse you. Jesus, he kept Tereo and abided Mino in his father's love. He continued in and obeyed his father's commandments. He endured ridicule. He stood against false doctrine and preached the gospel. You bless them by keeping the Lord's commandments and abide in his love and you preach the gospel. Most of us are grown men and women, but we're like children when it comes to the scriptures because we were never taught the scriptures, the true gospel of Jesus Christ. I wrote a sentence out here. Let me read it. We are grown men and women, children learning how to walk, peripateo, to pierce through, to go farther on a path, to obey the Lord's commandments. And bless them that curse you. I'm almost through. Who are those that we are to bless? Okay. Well, he said those that curse you. Okay. And this is a word I don't know how to. How, how, I can't even pronounce it in the Greek. Uh, it's K A T A R A O M A I. I can't pronounce it. It comes from. Katara is broken down into the word katara, which means excretion, intense excretion. Excretion, execretion, E X E C R A T I O N, excretion, sorry. It means to denounce you. They, these are the people that curse you. They're the ones that denounce you, who condemn you for your belief, who loathe you uh, for your con, uh, convictions to vilipend you, V-I-L-I-P-E-N-D-U. In other words, they regard you as worthless or of little value to them. If someone listens, preach the gospel to them. If someone is screaming at you, just walk away. So, most of those people in the church who hear this won't listen to what I'm saying. They will think, you know, 
that's what I'm saying is not important and it's of little value. They curse me and they don't even know it. That's what the scriptures mean. The world is going to think that way anyway, but the people that truly curse you are the people in the church who think of what you say and the scriptures that you preach have very little value to them. That's a curse to you. They are cursing you. Think about that. Let's go to Luke 6 and 22. Blessed are you when men shall hate you and when they shall separate from you from their company and shall reproach you. Which means reproach you is the word uh, it's another hard one. Uh, oh, I did as though. It means to defame you, to vilify you, to slander you, to, de uh, to denigrate you, to say you are a liar in your beliefs. So those are the people. They shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. They will say, they will defame you and say you're a liar. They will defame you and say that you don't know what you're talking about when you preach this gospel. They'll say you're a liar. They'll denigrate you. That's the worldly church that hated Christ. They didn't like the fact that it's God that saves us that we have no part in it. <sighs> Bless them that curse you. I cross. And we don't know who has ears to hear and eyes to see. I don't know who's going to look at this. Very few. My other channel I had a couple of years ago, I had like, I don't know, 40, 50 subscribers or something like that. And seems like every one of them would look at it. We don't know who has those ears to hear and eyes to see. The Lord has made even both of them in Proverbs 20 and 12. That's why Jesus said so many times to those who have ears to hear and eyes to see. It's all through the scriptures. He said it over and over and over. It's those who can hear that God gave that ability to. You bless those who can hear you. And quote, when you quote the scriptures, if you just quote a scripture, you bless the city when you walk in the commandments of God, agape. The city is safer and at peace. Yes, we quote scriptures. We preach the gospel, the good news. But I say, which is harder? To recite the words of our Lord or to live them? For me, living that gospel is the hardest part what we do and how we treat the worst of men that curses and think that we're worthless. How we walk in the commandments of God toward them is a big part of our cross. I think it's the hardest part for me. Walk in the commandments of God. I wanted to break one more scripture down. And it's an important one. This is love, agape, that we walk after his commandments. We're going to look at one word in there. We're to walk, peripateo, to pierce through, to go farther on a path. We've already looked at all that. In algebra, Things like if A equals to B and B equals to C, then we know that A is equal to C. When we put these things together, when I put these things together, I understand that to go further on a path is equivalent to the narrow way, which is equal to agape, which is equal to what Jesus said, I am the way and the way you will know, which is, equi which is equal to love your enemies and bless them that curse you. The scriptures is one big picture and it all joins together. And you cannot understand the New Testament 
without understanding the old. That's a if you just study the old the New Testament, you only get half the truth. The way is the gospel. It's our cross to obey. The way, the understanding, and following the gospel, because you if you have the Holy Spirit, the truth, you'll understand what the gospel is. It was written in our understanding by the finger of God before the foundations of the world. And it wasn't, oh, God knew who was going to, you know, be a believer. God chose who was going to believe her, be a believer of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. For Philippians tells us in 2.13, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. For it is God which worketh in you. The Holy Spirit, the truth that works in you. If you belong to the Lord, you will learn I will learn to love my enemy and bless them that curse me. If I belong to him, God will see to it through trials and tribulations in this life. I said enough. I said enough. I think I've got a lot to a lot to learn. I'll give an example how these scriptures change you. You could hear a false teacher, and I wouldn't advise you going to listen to false teachers. Um, you know all the Creflo Dollars and Jim Bakers and all these crazy people, but. There was a particular problem I had, and it was like I would give in to it. It was a sin of mine. I'd give in to it. I'd give it. I got to the point that I was sick of it. I was sick. I thought there was no escaping this problem I had. One day, flipping through the internet, and I and I. You know, I can pick out the false teachers, and this guy was a false teacher, but he quoted a scripture that day. Something happened in me, and I didn't really appreciate it right then, but he quoted a scripture, and I understood it. God gave me understanding of that scripture at that particular time in my life when I was fighting something that needed to change and it's gone. But it wasn't me that did it. It was a merciful God who saw me struggling, saw me hate what I did and knew that I couldn't do anything about it. I knew that my sinful nature, I could not get away from it. And I basically had given up. And I prayed, help me, Lord. And one day, I heard a scripture. Even false teachers can quote a scripture. And for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, it's going to do something to you. At the time assigned by God, for you to hear and for him to do his work in you. <sighs> I still say there are more men. And Jesus said, blessed are those are the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. He's talking about those that are emptied out of this world. They are emptied they, that men who see that they're at the bottom run of their life, they are in prison, they've been on drugs, they may be up on a murder charge. These are men that are at the lowest point of their life and they know there is nothing that they can do to save themselves from themselves. 
I say there are more men in this country that are in prison cells right now that will come to the truth and will enter into the kingdom of God, the true church of Jesus Christ, than the people that you see on this internet quoting scriptures and in the churches with false doctrine. If that light never shines in you and you never see how worthless you are and that you are a sinner, you will never enter into the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a church. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are one and the same. The Jews did not like to use the word God. This is before, uh, maybe 150 years before Jesus was born. The Jews changed their terminology to the kingdom of heaven because they did not want to bring reproach on themselves by using the word God. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are one and the same. If you study that, you know it. But you've got people trying to explain to you the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Well, how come in one scripture, in the same identical scriptures, you know, in, in the gospels, you'll have somebody saying the kingdom of God. And in the same scriptures, the sister chapter, it's called the kingdom of heaven. It's not a mistake. When they talk to the Jews, they used the kingdom of heaven when they were preaching. When they talked to the, the people that were from northern Israel, the, the Samaritans, they, they could use the kingdom of God. They're one and the same. And I have a warning for you. If you have people that walk around saying, God, talk to me, they're just off their medications or they need some. God gives you common sense to know good from evil. If you have a conscience, which is the word sunitis, in it, to sunitis is in the Greek. Sunitis, is, it means to see with. He gives you a conscience that you could see when you're right and wrong. But God is not talking to you. God is talking to you right here. We've got the word of God right here. When you have problems, when you run into a situation and you hear this scripture going over and, and flashing through your mind, that is God the living God talking to you and telling you how to deal with the situation or what to do. You hear these people say, I'm in the shower. I always talk, hear God when I'm in the shower. No, you're hearing your imagination. And if you study imagination, how it's talked about through the whole scripture, they imagine so many false things through the scriptures. And dreams, I warn you about dreams. Most of the 99.9% .9 of the dreams that, that people talk about are this flesh. Don't listen to people talk about the, their dreams. Everybody's scared, so they're dreaming about scary things in the economy. Don't listen to dreams. You listen to this. Don't listen to people who say, God told me. No, no, God didn't tell you. The scripture tells you. If you're hearing voices, it's your imagination. God talks to us through these scriptures. God talks to us through what we just went through. It's God that talks through these scriptures, and when people have understanding. Okay, Holy Spirit is the word hagios pneuma in the Greek. It means holy, pure, single pneuma, breath that comes from the truth. It comes from the word of God that you speak. 
the truth. It's <sighs> breath. Hagias pneuma. Holy, pure, single words that fall from the heavens of the church to the earth, to the plebeians, to those that don't understand. I've said enough. I've gone further than I thought. I didn't even, this is kind of an ad lib section on the end of here. But whoever hears this, <clears throat> I hope it can help you in some way. Hasta la vista.